everyone out this morning. I hope that you brought your Bible, and I hope that you'll turn and follow along with me in Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1. Now, one of the amazing things about the Bible is it really doesn't matter what year you're living in. Whether you're living in 20 AD or 2020 AD, it speaks to all of us. And it tells us all the exact same message from time to time to time. In Colossians chapter 1, in, in verse 1, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus our brother. Paul is, is writing to the church at Colossae, and you almost have to, when I think of Paul, I pause for a moment. Because here is a man who was persecuting the church, right? Here was a man who was a murderer. Here was a man who was violent. Here was a man who hated God's church. Here was a man who today we would be afraid of if he came knocking on our door, right? Throwing people in prison. But here is the same man changed by the gospel message of Christ. And so he's writing to the church and he says, Jesus, or an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Don't you know he was thankful to have the opportunity that he had? By the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He started his messages off of the letters off the same way almost every time. Grace and peace be unto you. Grace and peace be unto you. We live in a world that's not very peaceful, don't we? We live in a world that's, that's tumultuous all the time. He's telling the church, I hope that there's peace for you. I hope that you understand the grace that we have received from God. He says, I hope and pray that there is peace for you. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ praying always for you. He begins to emphasize the importance for us to pray for each other. He says, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have for all the saints. He says, even over here where we are, we hear about your love for each other and for all of the saints all over the world. He says, we hear about your love. We know what kind of people you are. You are faithful brethren. And if there are faithful brethren, you know what that means? There are also unfaithful brethren, right? He says, to the faithful brethren that are there, peace be unto you. He says, for the hope, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before, the, before in the word of the truth of the gospel. He says, you've been taught about heaven. We've preached heaven to you. You know what's laid up for you. You know the joy that's awaiting you. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. That we know. We know that the hope is there. We know that heaven is there. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you, right? So he says, you know of the hope that's awaiting you, so be happy. Be joyful. You know of the hope that's coming. Because you heard it in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come unto you as into all of the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it does also in you since of the day you heard it, and knew of the grace of God in truth. When we follow the Word, when we're doing what the Word says, 100% of the time we will produce fruit. 100% of the time. Now the church may not grow in numbers by tens of millions all at once. That's not the, all, it's not the only kind of fruit, is it? There's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. There's lots of kinds of fruit. There's us together as a family. There's all kinds of fruit. It's not always numerical. Amen. But the, when the truth is taught and the truth is obeyed, there is always, always, always fruit. Amen. And good fruit that is produced. He says, also you learn of Epaphroditus, or Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you, a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He says the message was passed on to us that you were, that you were praying for us. The message was passed on to us that you loved us. And we are praying for you as well. That you might walk worthy 
of the Lord, unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good word, and increasing in the knowledge of God. In order for us to have fruit, in order for us to be producing good fruit, in order for us to be growing, in order for us to be moving, we have to constantly and continually be growing in the knowledge of God. He said that's how you produce good fruit. That's how wisdom comes. That's how growth comes. That's how everything about the church comes. It comes from learning and growing in the knowledge of God. That's how it works. He says, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. He says, we're going to need to be a patient people because the people that we're talking to has been in idolatry and has been in the world so long. We're going to need to be a patient people. Amen. Because we're going to talk to them and they may turn away. And you talk to them again and they may turn away again. And you may talk to them for 10 years. And it may be the 20th year before they respond. So he says we need to be a patient and long-suffering people. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. Giving thanks to the Father. Because He has made us part of that inheritance, right? To be an inheritance is to be a child. He's made us children of light. His children, the followers of God. Amen. The family of God. <coughs> How amazing is that? That the one who created the universe, just look at the size of the universe, calls us His children. He says, an inheritance has been made for us. Who have delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us in the kingdom of His dear Son. He delivered us from sin. He delivered us from the power of darkness. He took us out of sin and put us in the kingdom of His dear Son. Well, how did He do that? When did that happen? What did Jesus tell Nicodemus? You must be born again. Amen. So when I'm taken out of the world of sin, I'm put into His body, which is also His kingdom. So how do I get into this kingdom? Well, you must be born again. We have to go down into the water and come up out of the water, right? We must be born again. Some people say the kingdom hadn't come yet. Well, how do I get translated into something that doesn't exist? The kingdom's here. The kingdom is now. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sin. That's when we come in contact with His blood, when we've been taken out of this world and put into the kingdom. That's when we have redemption of sin. That's when we have forgiveness of sins. That's when we contact the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. He says in verse 15, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and all things that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by, all, and by Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body. Notice it now. Jesus Christ. All things made by Him. All things made for Him. All things made with Him. He is the head of the body. The church. Amazing. He is the head of the body. The church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. The firstborn from the dead. He is the only one, notice it now, <laughs> he is the only one to go into the tomb, stand up, and walk back out, and never die again. The firstborn from the dead. What does that mean? He lives to die no more. He never died again. He never had his body. He never had his soul. He never died again. Why is that important? Because if Jesus died again, where are we? Why are we here? He walked out of that tomb alive. Amen. And then he went to heaven alive. 
That's so important for us. That's everything about the gospel. That he still lived. We can go to the tomb of every person that's ever lived. And we can find where they are. We can see where they lay. There's no body in Jesus' tomb. There's no body there. Well, why? Because he was dead. And now he lives again. The firstborn from the dead. For it pleased the Father, verse 19, that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they are things in the earth or things in heaven. He said the, the purpose for Christ coming to the earth was to bring peace between mankind and God. Was for him to reconcile mankind and God. So everything that he went through on the earth was for us. Everything that he dealt with on the earth was for us. He made peace through the blood of his cross and reconciled all things unto himself. He made peace through the cross. So when we think about the life of Christ and we think about all the things that he went through, all the things that he, that he dealt with in this life, he was doing every single one of them for me and for you. When he was betrayed, he did it for us. Amen. When he was attacked, went through it for us. Amen. When he was mocked, went through it for us. When he was sold to the Romans for 30 pieces of silver, went through it for us. Because at any point, he could have stopped all of it, couldn't he? At any point, he could have stopped everything in that chain of events. When the soldiers come to take him, he could have stopped it. But he didn't for us. Interesting thing here. When Peter cut off Malchus's ear, Peter was ready to go to war. One of the things that I always pictured in my mind, I don't know if you ever pictured it in your mind, when I pictured Peter swinging the sword, I always kind of pictured him going like that. When you start thinking about how he cut off his ear, Peter was swinging like this. Peter was trying to take off his head. Peter was trying to kill the guard. And Jesus told him to do what? He said, you put that sword down, right? Because what's about to happen has to happen. It has to happen. Because if it doesn't happen, you don't go to heaven. If it doesn't happen, no one on this earth goes to heaven. He says, I'm going through all the things that I'm about to go through because I want you in heaven. They're going to mock me and slap me and they're going to crucify me. They're going to put a crown of thorns on my head. They're going to beat me. They're going to just do all the things they can imagine to do to me. But that's okay. Because what is life? It's but a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. He says, I'm only here on this earth in this physical body for a little while. <laughs> I know where I'm going. And I know where I want you to go. And the only way you can get there, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He says, you need to know that. That what's about to happen has to happen. If you want to go to heaven, Peter, this has to take place. The lamb must be sacrificed. Everything that he did was for us to be reconciled to God. He says in verse 21, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. He says at one point we were enemies of God. Enemies of God. But he says now we've been reconciled. Well how do I become an enemy of God? When I followed sin. When I became a servant of Satan, I became an enemy of God. So here he's speaking to Gentiles. He says Gentiles, listen, at one point you were way out there. <laughs> because the Gentiles were as, as much idolatry as you can imagine being in. He says, you were an enemy of God. But now, 
you can say, I am a friend of God. Not only am I a friend of God, I'm a child of God. He changed all of that. He was able to take me from being an enemy to being his very own child. But now he's reconciled us. In the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. He says, you have been completely washed from your sins. Gone. Gone. Unreprovable. No one can make a claim that you still have that sin on you. It's gone. No one can stand up and say, wait a minute, I don't think so. Gone. We've been studying Job on Wednesday nights. Remember what Satan kept saying to God? Making all kinds of accusations. Saying, oh, the only reason he follows you is because of this. The only reason he does this is because of that. The only reason this is that. There's no more accusations to be made. There's no more claims to be had. We are unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Because when he looks at us, he doesn't see me. <laughs> he doesn't see you. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Washed, covered, children. He says, and if, that's very important, <laughs> if, we talk about all those things to say this, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature, which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. He says, if you continue grounded and settled in the faith, if you continue in all of these things, you will be completely unblameable. You will stand before God washed. You will stand before God redeemed. But what happens if I move away? What happens if I stop being grounded? What happens if I stop being settled? Remember what he said in Hebrews? There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. That's the danger. What he says. Verse 24. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. He says, I now rejoice in my suffering because I know what I'm suffering for. It's one thing to suffer. It's another thing to suffer for something. He says, I know what I'm looking towards. I know there's a reason that I'm going through <clears throat> what I'm going through. I know there's a reason to keep on pressing. Because I want to go to heaven. And I want you to go to heaven. So I'll take the beatings. I'll take the stonings. You can throw me out in the middle of the ocean. You can do all the things that you want to do to me. But I'm going to keep preaching the gospel because I know why I'm going through. I know that I've got my eye on something that I'm not going to give up. So he says in verse 25, Whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, which has been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints. When talking about the gospel, when talking about Christ, when talking about the coming Messiah, it says there were things <coughs> that the angels themselves desired to look into. The mystery. When's this going to happen? How's this going to happen? What's going to happen? Can you imagine being in heaven? I'm just, I, I, my mind, I think about things sometimes. Can you imagine the angels thinking, where's he going? Where's he going? He's leaving here? But what's he, where's he going? He's going to the earth. Why? Because he's going to die for mankind. What? Because the only thing they've ever known is sin, torment. Sin, torment. Mankind sin. God said, I've got a plan. I've got a plan. I'm going to bring them back into a 
right relationship with me. The angels, it says, desired to look into. They wanted to know how this worked. They were curious. He says in verse 26, Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but is now manifested in his saints. I get, I get frustrated when people talk about saints as though they're some special class of people. Well, these are saints, and y'all are just people. <laughs> because they're denying everything that God has said about His children. He says we're all saints. We're all followers of God. He says if we follow God, we're a saint. <laughs> And I don't need a robe, and I don't need a stick, and I don't need for people to, to declare me that. God has declared me that. God has declared you that. He says the saints which are at Ephesus, the saints which are at Colossae, the saints which are at Jerusalem, the saints all over the world. We don't need a vote. When we become children of God, God makes us His saints. God makes us His children. God makes us His family. So smile. Be happy. Because there is hope. There is the hope of heaven. So He says grace and peace be unto you that no matter what you go through in life, know that you're going towards something. Know that you're going towards heaven to whom God would make known what is the riches of His glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He says, this mystery is made known among the Gentiles. Remember why Peter didn't really want to go see Cornelius? I can't be in the house of a Gentile. They're unclean. Unclean. He says, here's the mystery. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter where you're from. Doesn't matter what you look like. Every person can be a child of God. That is the mystery among the Gentiles. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. Does that sound familiar? Whether you're Greek or barbarian. Does that sound familiar? It says all can be children of God. All can be saints in Christ. He says in verse 28, whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. He says, here's how you find, here's how you make someone perfect in Christ. We have to teach them. That's the only way. I can't wish them perfect. I can't hope them perfect. <laughs> I have to teach them. I have to teach them the truth. Because there's so much error in this world. And if we don't teach them, someone else will. Amen. But they won't teach them the truth. He says, this is how you find someone perfect. Complete. And that's to be taught what is right and what is wrong. We have to teach our children that, don't we? <laughs> what's right and what's wrong. Amen. Children start learning very early. I'm figuring that out. <laughs> They'll look at you after you tell them no and slowly keep reaching. But they have to learn what's right and what's wrong. They'll get mad and start swinging their hand. But the world does that. If you noticed, <laughs> here's what the Bible says. They start moving towards sin a little bit more. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says. Get out of here. I don't want to talk about it. How do we teach people? We give them knowledge. Knowledge. Knowledge is power. Amen. It's important that we know. How do I become good at anything that I do in life? I have to know about it. <laughs> Someone has to teach me about it. If I'm going to be a farmer, how do I farm? I'm going to have to talk to a farmer that knows what they're doing, right? If I'm going to be a police officer, how do I do it? I'm going to have to have somebody who's been a police officer train me. 
If I'm going to be anything in life, I'm going to have to talk to someone or read something that tells me how to do it. If I'm going to be a Christian, I'm going to have to read (laughs) and I'm going to have to study to learn what it means to truly be a Christian. Knowledge is power. It's one of the dangers that we face even in society when we don't read. I hate reading. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, I hate to read. But it's important that we do read. <laughs> because we learn so much when we read. <laughs> we learn so much when people teach us. Here we have the opportunity to read the book that God decided was important for mankind to read. <laughs> and we can teach people from this book. We don't chain it to a pulpit. <laughs> If you want a copy, we can get you a copy. (laughs) The Bible is such the most important book we'll ever read. Because the Bible is the only book that can tell me about God. The Bible is the only book that can tell me about His nature. The Bible is the only book that can tell me what He wants from me. The Bible is the only book that is inspired from God. So he says, whom we preach, warning every man. There is a warning. Because Jesus said when he comes back again, it will not be in peace. When he comes back again, it will be in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. So he says, we preach warning. Because we don't know when that day is. (laughs) That day could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be 2,000 years from now. But he says, we preach warning because hell is real. A lot of people don't like to use the word. They're afraid of the word. But the word is real. (laughs) It exists. And if we don't warn people, people are going to usher themselves in by the droves. So he talks about warning people. Teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. He says, Whereunto I also labor, striving accordingly to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Paul didn't want the praise. (laughs) Paul wanted people to be saved. Peter didn't want the praise. Peter wanted people to be saved. When Peter was encountered by people that they wanted to bow down to Peter... (laughs) Remember what Peter told him? Peter said, get up. I'm just a man. I'm just a man. Paul (laughs) says, I'm just a man. Don't worship me. I'm just a man. Where do they want the glory to go? God. All glory goes to God. Someone may teach me, and that's good. But they're only teaching what God revealed to me. (laughs) They're only teaching what God has revealed to us. All glory goes to God. All praise goes to God. Because it was Christ who died upon the cross. It was Christ who said, I will build my church, and He built it. It was Christ who washed us in His blood. It was Christ who said, I'll take it. I'll take the punishment for you. And it was God that so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoso believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. It was God who led the children of Israel out of Egypt. (laughs) It was God that led the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. It was God who's always there. So that He can say, listen, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Perhaps there's someone here this morning that needs to become a New Testament Christian. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Mark 16, verse 16, you're willing to repent of your sins, Acts 2.38, confess that He is the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10, and be baptized into Christ this morning, 1 Peter 3.21 then you can be a new creature. 
washed in the blood of the Lamb, forgiven, as Christ said, born again. Or perhaps you've let sin get in your way after becoming a New Testament Christian. You've let sin hold you back. You've let sin pull you back. He said it's important for us to remember this. As Christians, we must remain grounded. We must remain settled in the truth. If you have any need, come now while we stand and while we sing. Will you come, will you come with your poor broken heart, burden and sin?